The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, everyone. Welcome to the Stoa, a place for us to cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this very moment. And today we have a special Saturday session. Our boy, Evan uh, McMullen is here. Um, Stoen, a super user at the Stoa, uh, is coming to do a talk called The Bridge, uh, Rationality to Woo, or the other way around. I, my, my dyslexia might have mixed that one up. Uh, who is Evan, you might be asking? Uh, Evan is an independent phenomenological researcher who was formerly a hermit studying ancient wisdom traditions and doing psychedelics, uh, and he got dehermitized recently by the Stoa. So um, uh, you're welcome, Evan, uh, for, for that. Uh, and uh, we were jamming about, because uh, Evan is a guy who has a wealth of knowledge. Uh, if you come to the Stoa, it's very apparent from his, his questions and his contributions on the Discord. Um, and we were talking about what he could do here. And uh, this article from Dave Chapman um, on uh, from the, who's the blogger who does this ebook called uh, Meaningness. Um, and uh, it's a really great uh, article and it was the titles on the bridge. And so that is sort of the theme, which I imagine Evan will, will, will talk about further. Uh, that's framing the whole session. So this is gonna be a 90 minute session. There's gonna be a Q and A's. So if you have any questions, start dropping them in the, the chats uh, when we get to the Q and A portion. Uh, again, this will be on YouTube. So if you don't wanna be on YouTube, let me know and I'll read your question on your behalf. That being said, Evan, taking you in. Well, just give me one moment, one moment. That's gonna allow people to unmute themselves. Yeah, you're good. All right. Thanks, Peter. And uh, thanks for having me here on the STOA. I'm really excited to get to uh, share some of the stuff that's been alive for me with, uh, with everyone. So um, yeah, so the topic today is the bridge. It's useful if people have read David's article, but I'm going to go into some of that in the first part of my little presentation. So I've got a quick presentation, um, some slides just to help establish everyone's on the same page, get a frame for what we're gonna be talking about. And then I would like to get through that as quickly as possible. So um, uh, we can then have some time for some Q and A and explore what the collective intelligence here has to say about all this. So uh, with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing screen um, and uh, we'll go from there. So let's see. All right, so can everyone see? Give me a thumbs up if you can. All right. <clears throat> so um, let's get this full screen. There we go. So um, <clears throat> the bridge between what and where. So um, the essential problem that I'm trying to explore here is that human development has been crippled uh, for a long time by wrong relationship to things like truth and meaning. And so one downstream consequence of this is what people here on the STOA often refer to as the meta crisis, um, the crisis of crises, ecological, societal, et cetera. And so our societies um, and our subjective experiences both have been handicapped by something we might as well call rationalism. And I just wanna make a note here, this is not specifically referring to say less wrong style rationalism per se, if you're aware of that whole meme plex. So, um, this is more of the traditional rationalism that we're talking about here. So some background concepts that are gonna be useful in exploring this territory. So um, one, the map is not the territory. Uh, this has its origin in poor Gypsy's general semantics. It's a pretty common meme around these parts. Um, another uh, important background concept is that we cannot experience the world or reality directly. We can only experience mental representations of the world. And that also that, for that item right above about the world and our representations of it is true, but it's non-obvious. <clears throat> um, another point is that almost all language is indexical. Um, Sarah Perry uh, of Ribbon Farm did a really excellent session on the STOA recently exploring um, what indexicality is, but it essentially means language as a pointer. Language is pointing at something within a certain context and is rarely context independent with the possible exception of say pure mathematics. Um, so uh, 
Another background concept or assumption here is that rationalism mistakenly assumes that language-based conceptions of reality can be true in a non-indexical or context-free sense. Um, and also, so just as a metaphor here, a, a telescope cannot see itself. Um, the intellect also cannot fully intellectualize itself. Um, so this is some background stuff. Um, another thing, and this is, uh, so if people happen to read the David Chapman article that was linked as part of the event description and that Peter just linked to in the chat earlier, um, David Chapman refers to uh, Keegan's stages of adult development a lot. Now, Keegan is a, a developmental psychologist, formerly of Harvard, um, who did some really interesting research and work into the way that adult humans continue to develop after what we normally consider, you know, the threshold of adulthood in our society. So um, the three main elements of the Keegan stages we're going to be concerned with here are stage three, stage four, and stage five. Uh, according to Keegan's model, um, Keegan says that pretty much everybody in our society does reach stage three sometime usually around their teenage years. Um, and that's about 58% of the population according to his research. Uh, stage four is maybe 35% of the population and stage five is 1% or less. So um, each of these stages has to do with a shift between what is seen as the self or subject and what is available as objects that we are not identical to or identified with. So in stage three, the self, I am my relationships, the relationships as subject and you follow rules. Um, Stage four, uh, I have an identity, I am an identity, and I make choices. And then stage five, I hold or embrace many identities, I embrace paradox. Um, so uh, we'll take a deeper look at some of the aspects of the Keegan stages um, in the next slide. So this is a, a, a chart that I grabbed from David Chapman's site um, explaining the uh, Keegan stages. So um, this lays them out, the uh, the y-axis of this table is um, in case we've got stage and mode um, which is going to be on the x-axis actually so three four five and then we we see how this relates to um, objects what are the objects of our subjectivity what is the subject how are relationships related to how is ethics related to and how is epistemology related to so i'm not going to go through and speak about all of these things i'm going to zoom in on a couple things but if people want to just take a second to look at the diagram or the, 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 the chart here. So the important thing is that the subject in stage three is relationships. We are our, our relationships. Um, in stage four, the subject is a system of principles or projects. And then in stage five, um, the subject is uh, meaning making itself. We are meaning making in some sense. Um, and so uh, Keegan refers to stage three as the communal mode communal stage, um, stage four as the systematic mode or the systematic stage, and stage five as the fluid mode. Now, David Chapman also likes to use the term meta-systematic or meta-rational to refer to stage five, so you may find me slipping into that language as well during this uh, presentation. So um, it behooves us to ask now, why are people so resistant to staged models of adults? Well, I think this can be explained by the fact that according to Keegan, most people are at stage three. And stage three means that they are kind of allergic to asymmetrical relationships, such as those implied by stage models. I'm gonna go back to the last slide for a second. And we see under stage three, relationships are symmetrical and unstructured. And so stage three is very resistant to asymmetrical uh, relationships. Um, and then also, so we've got a significant chunk of the population at stage four, according to Keegan. Well, why is this still resistant to viewing a fully staged model? I think the answer has to do with the fact that they're able to notice the three, four distinction, but due to what Ken Wilber calls the pre-trans fallacy, they cannot recognize stage five. So what is the pre-trans fallacy? So um, pre-trans fallacy, this is a, a little excerpt from Ken Wilber's book, Sex, Ecology, and Spirituality, probably his longest and densest book. But um, this basically has to do with the fact that there are certain similarities, a sort of overtone type relationship between stage N minus one and N plus one. So for example, in this Keegan model between stages three and five. So um, both three and five are comfortable with um, what stage four would call irrational um, or non-systematic ways of relating to meaning and understanding in the self. And so when somebody in stage four uh, systematic rationality sees someone in stage five behaving in a way which seems irrational. They fail to recognize that this is a stage which is trans stage four 
and fail to identify it uh, and instead mistakenly identify it as something that is pre-stage four or in other words, stage three. Um, so a survey of the damage <clears throat> that has been done here with our culture and ourselves. Um, so uh, I wanna talk about scientism for a second. People have probably heard this term as distinct from the actual practice of science. Scientism, I would describe as the cultural and sometimes personal elevation of knowledge produced by the scientific method above all else, all other forms of knowledge. Um, there are uh, predictable negative consequences for individual humans, societies, and the entire biosphere um, to this uh, scientism. Um, we could look at the current ecological crisis, the current meta crisis of meaning in our culture, and so on. And so um, scientism also creates a sort of resistance to the kinds of perspectives, and as David Chapman likes to talk about, stances, mental stances, which would provide solutions to the problems of the meta crisis. So, um, science as a knowledge quest. So this is another excerpt from Sex, Ecology, and Spirituality, and it's super useful to um, think about what Ken Wilber identifies as the uh, three strands of any valid knowledge quest. So the first is an injunction, meaning if you want to know this, do that. So if X, then Y. Um, so what, what this means is essentially that it's not just a statement of fact, this is the case. It's a statement of if you do this, then you will get the following results, okay? Um, then the, the, the second um, part would lead up to uh, or disclose, as he puts it, the possibility of an illumination, an apprehension, an intuition or direct experiencing of the domain addressed by the injunction. So what this means is if you do this thing, then you get these results. That's something you can actually try at home. You know, science operates as a knowledge quest in this sense because experiments are supposed to be replicable. I can read about the double slit experiment. I can perform it for myself and get the same results. But I may have done the experiment wrong, or maybe the original experimenter did something wrong as well. Um, so then that leads to the third strand, which is communal confirmation um, or reputation. So we have a community of practitioners who all have performed that same injunction have all seen what happens, and then we can discuss and refine the injunction in an iterative process among the community. Um, this is very similar to the structure, say, not just of science, but of Buddhism, where there's specific instructions. If you do this with your mind, you will get the following results. Um, you can actually do those instructions and get some results. And then there's a community, which in Buddhism is called the Sangha of practitioners who can refine their understanding of the original injunction and build on it in an iterative process. So. Um, knowledge quests are awesome and great, and yet also they are what I call domain local projects. So um, what is a knowledge quest? Another way to uh, phrase this would be that knowledge quests are collective exercises in map making. Maps are necessarily data compressions over reality. And again, this means the map is not the territory. And so these data compressions emphasize certain features as salient and compress away others as irrelevant. And this, this is a corollary of the fact that all maps are lossy compressions because our brains are significantly smaller than reality. Um, so the knowledge quests and the maps produced by them are therefore of primarily domain local utility. So I'll go into that again in a second. So the domain of the scientific knowledge quest. So the knowledge quest we call science is focused on and primarily useful in the domain of reality outside of our minds, the physical world. Um, and it's had enormous success in this domain. And unfortunately, when its methods and conclusions are applied outside of its domain, then some pretty predictable negative effects ensue. And so what do I mean by this? Well, we as a global macro culture are more powerful and also less happy and less responsible with our choice making. Um, for example, with respect to sustainability, both economic and environmental than humanity has ever been before. So this is what I mean by predictable negative consequences of applying the results of a knowledge quest outside of its uh, domain local uh, uh, specialization. So some other knowledge quests that are worth pointing to here, um, some of the introspective wisdom traditions. So we could point to various flavors or strains of Buddhisms. Uh, Stoicism within the Western tradition uh, strikes me as a valid knowledge quest. Um, shamanism in the broad sense, not restricting ourselves to the literal Siberian shamans, but the shamanic ways of knowing of many indigenous cultures. Um, 
the Yathromantis lineage. Uh, Yathromantis means priest or prophet healer in Greek. And this was the tradition that we now refer to as a lot of the pre-Socratic philosophers, like people like Parmenides and Empedocles and Pythagoras and so on. Um, Christianity in some of its forms is uh, very much one of these uh, valid introspective knowledge quest wisdom traditions. And th there's many more that I'm leaving out here. So um, another point that's worth considering now is that global models may exist in our brains or may, our brain may have some global modeling function, but they can't be languished well. So it does seem plausible that our brain constructs a global model of ourselves in the world, um, but this model is non-linguistic in nature, if it even exists. Um, the models that we can communicate in symbolic linguistic form will always be domain locally specialized, and they will grow increasingly useless or wrong as one moves away from the center of their domain of specialization. And this all has to do with the indexical or pointing at within a context nature of most or all language. So um, I want to talk about the overbroad application of scientific models. So the less wrong rationalists are really onto something with something they call fake frameworks, which comes from an article that was written by um, Michael Smith, aka Valentine, who's been a previous guest on the STOA. Um, so uh, often the most accurate model from the perspective of science is some combination of computationally intractable or misleading or useless for our desired practical purposes. And, and science itself is kind of quite aware of this and has constructed models at very many different levels of abstraction to account for this issue. So we have physics models, we have chemistry models, we have biology models, or even within the realm of physics, we have for very small things, quantum models, then for human scale things, Newtonian physical models, and then for very large and or fast things, relativistic physics models. And these are all different levels of abstraction. And it's important to remember that all abstractions are leaky. So um, <clears throat> I now want to discuss the introspective wisdom traditions as a different cultural specialization from what we did in the West with science. I want to point out that more effort by smart people has been put into, for example, Buddhism or Christianity over the past 2000 years than what we call science by probably many orders of magnitude. Um, and that this effort was not wasted. This was not going down a blind alley. Um, so the domain specialization of these introspective wisdom traditions is creating models which work well for human phenomenological reality, and maybe they work less well with external physical reality. Um, these traditions have produced many insights, psychotexts, and framings which consistently lead to good outcomes for many humans. Um, you can see the research that shows that religious people are, for example, happier and better adjusted and even live longer um, and are healthier, for example, right? Um, and so uh, science has a much worse track record in this regard. So see, for example, the current mental health crisis, the meaning crisis, and what I would call the uh, persistent low-grade nihilism as modern cultural background noise. So um, this brings me to the point that science is not a path. So I'll go into what I mean by paths here for a second. Um, humans seem to need paths of some sort to become fully developed, sovereign, ethically grounded adults. Paths tend to have a focus on ethics and mental skill and fundamental insights into the nature of experience. In Buddhism, we call this the three trainings and morality, concentration, and insight. And so these insights that are produced by paths are in the domain of subjective and intersubjective phenomenolo phenomenological reality or phenomenology. And this is really outside the proper domain context of science. Um, and paths do not need to be grounded in scientific knowledge. Ideally, they just need to stay in their lane and avoid making obviously disprovable empirical ontological claims about the external universe. So um, <clears throat> scientism, as in this sort of uh, strange relationship that a lot of people in our society have with science as the ultimate truth and authority, as path inoculation. So what do I mean by this is that scientism kind of inoculates people, unfortunately, against being able to approach paths in the sense that I've been discussing them. Um, how does this operate? Well, there's a pedantic rejection of what the rationalists call fake frameworks, which uh, unpacks basically as pragmatically useful, but ultimately physically untrue ways of organizing your thoughts about the world. Um, Scientism also has a tendency towards a rejection of pragmatist epistemological concerns in favor of a sort of absolutist scientific epistemology. Um, it has an inculcation of a false sense of the propositional facts which are generated by the scientific method as somehow privileged um, 
ep uh, epistemological magisterium. And so what I mean by this is that um, scientism posits that the propositional facts generated by science are of a significantly better kind than any other system. Um, and scientism itself has not reckoned with the fallout of the 20th century, uh, meaning, say, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, generalized uncertainty. Uh, you can look up the Fourier trade-off if this is unfamiliar. Um, Turing and computability. All of this stuff hasn't really been, you know, uh, organized into the uh, real scientismist worldview, which you know maybe you can find exemplified in, say, Facebook groups like "I effing love science" or whatever. Um, and so I want to make a note here that groups like that and scientism in general is mainly practiced by non-scientists um, and especially people that are in scientifically informed fields such as engineering, medicine, and IT, but who are not themselves engaged in adding to the body of scientific knowledge. Um, and science has also very recently ignored the outputs of the other knowledge quests, or if it notices them at all, has denigrated them as utterly wrong-headed. And I do want to note that this is changing, but it's changing slowly. So, um, you might say, but wait, these other knowledge quests are full of woo. So um, yeah, uh, people often have this sense that these other ways of knowing are full of dangerous bullshit. And I'd be the first to say that this is often true. Um, so we wanna ask with uh, how do we engage with these other domains without being infected by the, the bad kinds of woo? So I'm gonna just be explicit and say things like the secret um, and, and other things of that ilk. Well, my answer to that is we need to take phenomenology seriously. So um, before we get into taking phenomenology seriously, or maybe as a mini bridge into that, um, our naive or native ideas of how minds work in our culture are also full of woo and bullshit. Um, so we have a major cultural hangover from Christian and Cartesian dualism. Um, now, I do want to say that race extensa and race cogitans in the Cartesian sense can be a useful concept, but not in the way that the dualism is usually used. Um, and then the monist solutions are also pretty unsatisfying. Um, idealist monism has essentially zero predictive utility um, for us as beings. And physicalist monism runs into all these problems with strange loopiness, questions of what is the ultimate substrate or closed causal layer, and of course the hard problem of consciousness among other issues. Um, and so just because we've been born into a culture where these ideas are the default does not mean that we should accept them uncritically. And I do want to make a quite a slight dig at Western psychology here and say that's not even pro a proper science in the way that, say, physics or biology or even quantitative economics are. Um, Freud and his disciples remain a huge influence, and he was just telling just so stories, which, um, from a, a mathematical point of view, could be viewed as model overfitting. So. Um, Western psychology in practice has yet to integrate computational neuroscience, behavioral economics, and other recent innovations in Western science. Um, the knife's edge of Western science is beginning to converge on a frankly Buddhist or stoic way of describing and relating to the self, but our culturally commonsensical ways of relating to the self have not caught up and neither has our practice of psychology as a field. Um, so we don't really need to know the neuroscientific details here in order to come into better relationship like things with like uh, with things like the sense of self. But if we do want to know or if we do know these details, then they are increasingly adding up to a picture which supports this bridge that I'm in the middle of proposing. here. So um, my bridge proposal here is that phenomenological self inquiry is a possible bridge from stage four to stage five. Some reasons for this are that all other models are built from phenomenolo phenomenological observations, whether we recognize this fact or not. All the models that our brains construct are attempts to explain or predict regularities in our phenomenological experiences over time. They're compressions over the vector of bits of our sense data and, and trying to uh, do this for predictive utility. You could see um, you know, the predictive coding or uh, free energy or entropic brain type models for some more detail on this. Um, so uh, I recommend returning to this fundamental early and often as for example, in the martial arts, even the greatest masters will frequently return return to the fundamental practices like standing state. So um, serious and dedicated phenomenal phenomenological inquiry seems necessary for healthy adult human development. And I think this point is severely underemphasized in Western culture and educational models. Um, and it's honestly, in my perception, more important to do this than to be grounded in STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics-based propositional knowledge. If we don't do this, then our sense of self and how we relate to the self is determined 
primarily by infection, by viral memes floating around in the cultural memeplex that we find ourselves in. So these viral memes are usually actually anti-useful from the perspective of the individual. And they often serve to reinforce existing social power dynamics and to condition us to relating to ourselves in ways which are disempowering, confusing, and worst of all, ultimately unenjoyable. So um, I do wanna make out a uh, point here that the West as a culture used to have more of this. And some of the examples I'd point to here are the Greek philosophers like Parmenides, Socrates, and Plato. Uh, Parmenides, the founder of Western logic, and I could do a whole series rant on him, but I, I will spare you guys for now, um, as well as Socrates, um, both saw their wisdom as coming from a daemon or a god or goddess. Um, and this is a, explicitly a non-rational in the modern Western rational sense um, way of relating to uh, to the source of, of logic and knowledge. Um, the Stoics, both the Greek and Roman Stoics, also had a, a viable um, introspective phenomenological wisdom tradition. The uh, hermetic and alchemical tradition also is an example of this. And many forms of Christian and Jewish mysticism are also examples of the Western native um, phenomenological inquiry traditions. Um, I wanna make a note here that the Greeks called what Keegan's referring here to as stage five or the fluid mode, they called it metis. And um, this has connotations of cunning, trickery, the kind of cunning and trickery that lets you escape the tricks played on you by reality. And Odysseus was given as a human exemplar of Metis. And um, his patroness, one of his patronesses, Athena, was sort of, among other things, a goddess of Metis. So that's a worthy thing to follow up on mythologically if that's uh, something that floats your boat. So um, now these, were, these uh, Western traditions were mainly dispensed with due to their claims about external reality um, which were not compatible with empirical scientific results when we did finally get around to inventing science. And I think that the baby here was thrown out with bathwater. So what happens when you take phenomenological inquiry seriously? Well, the models of mind and self that we inherit from our culture are fairly quickly sorted. Most of them are useless or worse are harmful. Some of them are useful starting points and some may even seem compatible with one's own empirical results. I posit that if you are skilled and dedicated, you will end up rediscovering or reinventing all of the good parts of things like Buddhism or Stoicism. And you may also spend years in fruitless investigation of blind alleys or going down garden paths. So no, crap, what do we do there? Well, um, I like to call this refining the golden baby from the dross of the bathwater. Um, so uh, human competitive advantage uh, in terms of our ecological niche has to do with um, culture and mimetics. We can adapt very fast to changing circumstances because we're less programmed genetically and we have the ability to reprogram ourselves in some sense mimetically and culturally. Um, I would like to also mention that just because the metaphysics or ontology or epistemology of a given ancient wisdom tradition may be garbage, that doesn't mean that the practices that came out of it are. Remember the injunction from a wisdom tradition or a knowledge quest, if you do this, then the following result will happen. Well, a lot of the injunctions from these ancient wisdom traditions are empirically verifiable in your own phenomenology. Um, I'd also like to mention in the sense of refining the golden baby from the dross of the bathwater that meta sanghas, as Vince Horn was discussing yesterday on the STOA, um, can act as a higher order coordination mechanism between different knowledge fellowships questing in similar territory. Um, and that independent phenomenal, phenomenological inquiry is still crucial for forward progress, just the same way that science does still make progress primarily on the backs of individual humans with splinters stuck in their minds. And so the meta sangha or the meta meta sangha or whatever must also include science as a valid knowledge quest and some sort of communion with the others. Um, so I wanna take a, a, a little tour into the phenomenology of metacognition. Um, so the term metacognition is often thought of as thinking about thinking by analogy to things like the term meta language, which is often framed as language about language. This isn't really a great model. Um, for what is meant in the literature by metacognition or metacognitive introspective awareness, um, given the extremely different felt senses, as Gindlin might put it in his focusing modality, between metacognitive awareness versus propositional cognitive thinking or analysis. So um, I do believe that developed metacognitive awareness does seem to be some sort of prerequisite for what Keegan calls stage five development. 
And uh, that this seems to be because in order to be fluid with respect to models or representational systems in a conscious way, it really helps to have introspectively noticed the way that the mind already fluidly switches frames in a contextually informed way. Um, so this uh, is just a little digression into phenomenology, metacognition, context, and indexicality. So first off, the capabilities of stage five, um, meaning the fluid switching of contexts and models are already there and we use them implicitly or subconsciously all the time. Um, phenomenological inquiry into the nature of metacognition and metacognitive introspective awareness can help give us conscious access to this fluid model shifting faculty or the fluid mode or stage five. Um, once we have done this, we can then use um, system two in the system one or system two or elephant and rider dichotomy in its proper role to attentionally optimize over time these fluid model context shifts. And phenomenological inquiry into internal experience with respect to our languaging of things also helps us more consciously grok the almost entirely indexical nature of linguistic statements, which then allows us much greater flexibility in terms of how we can allow ourselves to apply our linguistic communicative faculties. In other words, it can help us stop trying to impose our own chosen systematic frames and languaging on a conversation and instead be quite um, open to a, meeting people where they are with the way that they language things and getting a sense of where they're pointing at with that, that, that way of languaging things. Um, so is this one bridge among many? I suspect so. Um, this uh, phenomenological inquiry as a bridge between four and five, I don't claim is a, uh, the only bridge um, at all. So given the indexical nature of language as discussed previously, it seems highly likely to me that there are multiple very different linguistic framings of a four to five bridge, which might all work well for different humans and different personal or linguistic or cultural contexts. Um, this uh, presentation I've been doing and my whole project is just one attempt at an indexical gesture towards an available bridge. I make no claims about whether or not this gesture is optimal. Um, and I think we really seem to need a Sangha or Meta Sangha structure of bridge architects, bridge builders, bridge crossers, and bridge guides all working together. And so if you feel called to do so, I'd like to invite people here to collaborate with me and with each other on this and other attempts to build these bridges. Um, so I have a few closing thoughts um, in relating this to some of the other content that we see on the STOA a lot. So the four to 4.5, which I didn't go into very deeply, but 4.5 is a transitional state between stage four and stage five, which tends to um, result in deep personal discomfort and an experience of nihilism. Um, so this four to 4.5 to five um, movement in Keegan stages seems to relate fairly uh, directly, I meant to say directly, sorry for the typo, to the frame commonly used around these parts of the modern, to the postmodern, to the metamodern. Uh, Keegan and others working with this stage model seem to claim that there are none, or perhaps very few, stage five organizations or social spaces, though most of this research was done uh, decades ago. So the STOA itself seems to me to be approaching a space operating according to stage five ways of relating to meaning. Um, and so in Keegan's view, institutions have been a traditional bridge from three to four. One of the main ways that people learned to operate in a systematic mode and transition out of a purely communal mode was to accept employment in a stage four, four bureaucratic organization or to otherwise receive education from a stage four systematic institution like a college or engineering school. Um, and uh, so spaces like this one, uh, like the STOA, seem to be pretty promising for helping provide conceptual bridges as well as social support for the stage four to stage five transition. And um, then I have some open questions that are really just, I really wonder about this stuff and I'm interested in people's takes on this, both maybe in the Q and A as well as like, if you wanna email me or uh, uh, as a note, I created a discord for the bridge. If people wanna coordinate and talk about this later, I'll be throwing the link into the chat here um, at a point in the near future. So these open questions are, how do staged models like Keegan's relate to traditional spiritual paths? So for example, like Buddhist enlightenment as expressed in various models like the Theravada four path model, the Tibetan 10 Bhumi model, et cetera. 
Um, also, what axes of human development, if any, and maybe enlightenment here qualifies, are orthogonal to the Keegan stage uh, framework of development? And are there inherent limitations for certain human individuals which might present them from ever actualizing certain stages, such as four or five? And if so, how can we, one, successfully transition into a metamodern or stage five society before the metacritic crisis eats us all, and two, provide for the integration of such people into metamodern society, and three, do that without introducing toxic interstage power dynamics whereby people of perhaps more limited capacity are not made to feel bad for that fact. Um, so these are some open questions that I'm interested in exploring um, now and in the future with, with, with uh, the collective intelligence. And then I have some recommended resources, some of the stuff that I've based my work and my understandings on. So the works of Thomas Metzinger, especially being no one, pretty much all of the works of von Neumann, Alan Turing and Shannon um, in the areas of information theory, Yosha Bach's computational metapsychology, Forrest Landry's eminent metaphysics, mastering the core teachings of the Buddha by Daniel Ingram, who will be on the Stoa soon. Um, the works of Peter Kingsley, David Chapman, his entire corpus of all his web published books, uh, Shenzhen Young's uh, Science of Enlightenment, Michael Taft's Deconstructing Yourself website and series, and the research that's been done by Judson Brewer and his colleagues um, regarding the uh, neural correlates of meditative states and uh, stages. So with that, I believe that is it for my presentation and uh, we can go ahead and start talking as a collective. Dang, <laughs> that was a workout on my mind right there. Um, so I'll, I'll um, while a question uh, is cooking here, I'm gonna let it uh, um, cook a little more, but uh, I'll take in Rob because he had had something that I was thinking about. So Rob, if you can uh, kick start us off with the Q and A. Sure, and first, Evan, that was amazing. I'm still reeling from it, it's great. <laughs> um, so my question is, Concerning how hard it is to actually go through phenomenological inquiry, especially by oneself. I think the reason it's, or the, the fact that it's so hard is the reason that paths have been made into strict traditions. And that's seeming to change culturally now that we're in an age of post reason, path making itself has been kind of open sourced, um, which for practitioners puts the, all the paths in very noisy, ambiguous context. It's a little hard once you know that they all join up somewhere to figure out how to navigate all the interconnected paths. So my question is, what do you think the meta path is through this noise? How do you select paths as they're useful to you? What are the maybe the well, does it have to do with developing a prerequisite faculty? in the aspirant um, or some sort of compass that you might need to use to sort of navigate that, that field. I'll, I'll just turn it over to you and see what your instincts say. Yeah, so I'm glad you asked that question because um, it's part of what I'm trying to gesture at with this whole thing here, right? Um, phenomenological self-inquiry is a pretty broad term that we can just basically translate or cash out as paying deep sustained and serious attention to the inner workings of one's own consciousness, right? And to me, that's the North Star for this. If you do that, that's the injunction component of the knowledge quest I'm suggesting that we should be going on. And then you will find various interesting things there about how the mind and your yourself works, which are very different from the ways that have been taught to you by our Western culture, um, at least if you had a typical upbringing. And you will find that there are communities of practitioners. Some of them may call themselves Buddhists. Some may call themselves Stoics. Some of them may, may be random crazy people like me that show up on the Stoa. And so then of course the next step is to communicate with these other people who are also doing phenomenological self-inquiry and, and help refine each other's understandings uh, of, of how this works. Um, so I kind of see these paths as the sort of thing that we have to construct in a social context um, to avoid going down all of the dead ends and back alleys. And we can be inspired in doing so by reading various books or uh, getting various teachings from the ancient wisdom traditions. But most of those ancient wisdom traditions are quite culturally bound. And some of the highest quality material, for example, I find in Buddhism. 
but I actually had to learn how to read multiple dead languages to get access to that in a usable form. That took a decade or so, and we ain't got that kind of time. So, you know, I think that we really can reinvent or rediscover a lot of the most fundamental practices and insights here simply by being a good faith community that interacts with each other via these popular things that here at the Stoa we refer to as the principle of charity and rule omega. And we just do our own self-inquiry and we share about it. And then we refine our self-inquiry based on the collective intelligence or wisdom that emerges from such sharing. To me, that's really all you've got to do. And yes, it's an iterative process that takes time, but as long as we can still be principle of charity and rule omega oriented towards newcomers who might have less experience than ourselves and help onboard them, then I think we have a, at least a shot at leveling ourselves and our society up in time to solve the global meta crisis. Any follow up, Rob? A little, this might be a lot. <laughs> I like how you point this toward community. Is phenomenological self-inquiry ever giving rise to something that's phenomenological inquiry beyond the self? Yeah, I think it totally does. And this is part of why the bridge goes from rationality to scare quotes, woo, right? Um, it's difficult to point indexically to with language that has evolved in a social environment that is not developed enough to have a good handle on this stuff. But that being said, I would say if you want to go back and watch the Stoa session put on by Alexander Tartarin, this is an exploration of some of the intersubjective phenomenological territory which is out there and which I think is kind of on the edge of any person's thinking right now because we're starting to approach a critical mass of people able to approach intersubjective phenomenology from a stable enough grounding in their own subjective phenomenology, if that makes sense. And I mean, things like that we do on the Stoa as well, like collective presencing, I think is another example of an approach into the intersubjective phenomenology. So, yeah. Cool. Chris, uh, Chris D, you had a few questions. Yeah, hey, Evan. Um, I, I guess we can continue the thread of phenomenological self-inquiry um, because I'm getting the sense that even the most wisest individuals with the highest self-awareness um, can also be, uh, subject to blind spots as well. So would you say that a sort of potential remedy for this is to have a, some sense of accountability and to engage in collective intelligence to, that, to discover their blind spots, their phenomenological blind spots? And I guess my reasoning for this is to sort of connect collective intelligence to, I guess, what the hippies call oneness or cosmic consciousness or whatever. Thanks. OK, that's a big one. Um... To, to address the first part first, I think um, to go back to the Ken Wilbur derived definition of the uh, features of a valid knowledge quest, the community intelligencing part of that is crucial. Without that, it's not a valid knowledge quest, right? Um, you have to do the injunction, get the results yourself, and talk about it with other people to see, did I do this wrong? Did you do this wrong? that's harnessing of the collective intelligence to avoid our blind spots. Like in one of my early slides, I talked about how a telescope can never see itself and an intellect can never fully intellectualize itself as object, but I may be able to do that for you and you can do that for me in ways that can provide a mutual support and that's the function of community in this context. Um, as to the, the cosmic consciousness, that sort of thing, I think that that gets into some really complicated issues of state versus stage. Um, you see this a lot in say the Buddhist tradition as well where enlightenment is often thought of as an experience to be sought out. And yet it is not any particular experience. It's a shift in the overall mode of relating to all experience. Um, and that has to do with the state versus stage uh, dichotomy. So there are many available and interesting mental states that people can enter kind of regardless of what stage they're at. And it's important to have, again, a community collective intelligence structure to help support people when they enter states, or as Robert Anton Wilson might say, reality tunnels, which are quite disjoint from the majority consensus narrative so that any insights gleaned in those states or reality tunnels can be integrated into the whole person without causing undue disruption to that person or to their social fabric. 
Eight. Okay, cool. Um, Alex. Alex L. You still here? Are you talking to me? Did you say Alex yes. L? Alex L, yeah. Huh. All right, so I have to admit, I'm pretty behind the game here. Um, I haven't tuned in in a while, and my question for you as a former scientism follower is between all of these wisdom traditions that you've studied and looked at, what are some of the common threads that seem to shine out through all of that? Yeah, so the, the number one that strikes me is, in fact, what was my focus today, which is phenomenological self-inquiry, taking seriously the practice or the path of observing the inner workings of one's own mind in a disciplined and sustained way. Um, everyone from the Stoics to the Christian monks to the Jewish mystics to all different flavors of Buddhist and Hindu esoteric traditions to the Hermetic, everybody talks about that as being crucial. Right. And so to me, that is if I had to pick one takeaway out of all of those ancient wisdom traditions, that's it. Now, the specifics of what practices you would use to do that, in my opinion and experience, matter far less than that you do that in a disciplined, dedicated and, and, and consistent way. Over time. And also then that you you discuss the results of that investigation with a community of people that are also doing their own subjective phenomenological investigation so you can then begin to establish which insights you've had are generally applicable in a maybe perhaps intersubjective way um, versus which ones are just quirks of your own mental structure. One of the tendencies that you see as a negative tendency to come out of these traditions is a over generalization or an over universalization of insights that individual meditators have had. Right. Assuming um, this is what the rationalists like to call the typical mind fallacy. Right. Um, assuming that other people's minds are more similar to yours than they, in fact, are. And so the community aspect and the interchange, the Sangha aspect is also one of the crucial things that I draw out that's common to all these wisdom traditions. Thanks. Appreciate it. Colty, you're up next. So I had two queries that in the electricity of my brain are kind of fusing in a weird way. Um, so I'll state them both and, and maybe you can tie them together. Um, in one of your later slides, you were posing the question um, for continued inquiry about uh, what you called inherent limitations. And I was curious um, uh, if you could like expand more on that, if you see that being kind of social and economical, um, for particular individuals, or if it's maybe more neurological, um, or if it starts to be, <laughs> puts a coin in the meta jar, meta phenomenological, like how do you like, expand on um, people's shared uh, inner workings? Um, and then to use a metaphor, kind of wondering if this is a multi-way bridge, right? Like, can you move from a certain stage into another stage and back again, both as an individual and collectively. Um, that's imprecise, but I hope you kind of get the place I'm trying to take this, this query. Yeah, totally, both great questions. Um, so the first one, um, I would say that I tend to say yes and to both of those um, in that I don't see a clear dichotomy there. For example, um, Poverty and malnutrition literally causes brain damage, right? Um, trauma literally causes brain damage. So even if we're restricting ourselves to say organic brain damage as a limiting factor for stage capability, then situational context can cause that just as much as say some inherent or genetic um, you know, uh, trigger could cause that. So yes to both of those things. Um, and then as to the second part, um, Keegan goes into this a bit, and I, I kind of agree with his take on this, which is that we talk about states versus stages, and people in essentially any stage can occasionally have access to the capabilities and modes of relating of the higher stages. Um, and so Keegan talks about um, having stabilized a certain stage as a thing. So there's a stage that you've stabilized, and that's sort of your home base under normal circumstances, but 
under stress or duress. So, or maybe you're extremely drunk, you're having a really bad day, you just got hit. You can absolutely regress and, uh, and lose access to a stage that you've mainly stabilized and operate from earlier stages and ways of being. And similarly in peak experiences or really positive emotional high vibe states, you can absolutely get a taste for the capabilities of the higher stages. Um, you know, w without having stabilized them, and I think this has to go has to do with um, you know the idea that that really fundamentally, in order for stage five to be a thing at all, it has to be operating all the time because we always are switching fluidly, contextually between different modes of relating to the world and making meaning and relating to ourselves. It's just a question of noticing this consciously and operationalizing it consciously rather than letting it run as a background process. If that makes sense. It does. And I appreciate that you brought uh, trauma and its effects on the brain into the conversation, um, particularly because <laughs> uh, there's some irony in the sense that although I have been medi medically, scientifically, air quotes here, diagnosed with PTSD, um, a lot of the, those frameworks for healing it didn't help as much as some of the things that were more well integrated woo. Uh, so I just think you've made a lot of really delicious connections in this talk and I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. That's part of what kind of gave me the impetus for this in general is that most of the people that I know that have experienced real psychological or psycho-emotional or psychophysical healing have done so from the framework of practices and um, worldviews, which are not what we consider to be mainstream Western psychology and psychiatry. So, yeah. All right. Uh, Hannah, you had a question statement thought you'd like to share. <laughs> question statement is the, the best. Yeah. Good one. <laughs> uh, what did I write? So, okay, I remember. Uh, I found in my personal practice that going from scientism to uh, something like integrating the rationalist, less wrong part of me and the witchy woo part of me. First step was saying, well, if I'm only going to believe in science, then I can just do science to see if this is a thing. And that was part of what helped me break up that um, you know, cultural programming in my brain. So sharing that in case it's useful to anyone or you have any thoughts on it. But I'm left with the question, how do we bring the science to the woo people? I don't know if that's something you can answer, but that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question and is sort of, um, I'll just start out by being very honest, is, is has not been my primary um, focus of inquiry. So I have some speculations about it, but I feel like they're wet, less well-founded than the stuff that I've been talking about so far. Um, so I, I wanna sort of disentangle here the notion of science versus the notion of empiricism, right? Because it's actually not really possible to do science on a lot of the claims of the more woo or introspective traditions because the conditions are not perfectly repeatable, right? Um, it is possible to be very empirical about those sorts of investigations, which I, I highly recommend, but, but some, somebody on the science side may make the claim, well, you're not really doing science. And I think that's kind of a valid claim for them to make within a certain framing or context. And so I'm careful about selling that as, um, as, uh, you know, uh, as doing science on the inner world. I think that science is a, is a knowledge quest whose domain is the external world and that phenomenological self-inquiry is a knowledge quest whose domain is the inner world. And like I mentioned earlier, that the farther you get out of the domain specific context, the worse, the, the, like the duller the tools become, so to speak. Um, now, as to the second part of what you were saying about um, how do we bring the science to the woo people? Um, well, just like anything else, um, I don't know if people here have uh, read Jed McKenna, who's a sort of interesting heterodox thinker about the idea of enlightenment, but one point he makes um, 
which you could also phrase as that Anais Nen quote about the bud and the flower, is that people don't generally grow because they, in some sense, want to. They grow because it has become too painful not to. And so I don't know that it's really possible and or right to like bring science to the woo people more so I look at it as supporting people through whatever stage of their own development they're going through. You know, um, things like the principle of charity, things like operating from compassion and right action are important regardless of how wrong someone's ideas seem to you, right? And so for me, it's, it's just about good faith dialogue and, and working with people where they're at and, and noticing when, um, like, like there's a move that a lot of people make where they fail to notice that somebody else is not hearing them. And they keep trying to explain something in the same way. And this is why I was mentioning earlier about like, once you do this phenomenological self-inquiry, specifically with respect to metacognitive awareness of language, you gain some significant additional flexibility where you can sort of put on the cloak of someone's native personal language and start trying to point to things indexically within their own way of languaging things. And that's the closest thing I have to an answer for how to bring science to the woo people, if that makes sense. Any follow -up? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that I appreciate your untangling of the words that I was using and pointing to uh, pretty much what I wanted to say more accurately. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Evan is the clarity machine of the, the store. <laughs> um, all right, let's, let's take in Sarah. <coughs> Sarah B, are you still in the room? She said her mic's broken. All right, um, we'll, we'll take in Ryan uh, then, and then we'll circle back to her in a moment. What's going on, Evan? This was totally rad, super fun. Um, Thanks. Yeah, the store is lit right now. Uh, <laughs> it's gonna be awesome this next month too. I can't wait to hear you talk to David Ingram. I can't hear you talk to Forrest. It's going to be crazy. Anyway, um, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering where psychedelics fit into your thoughts on phenomenological self-inquiry and where, how, when would you advocate slash not advocate for their use? Um, yeah. So that's a really complicated question, obviously. Um, I guess a caveat. For me, psychedelics were a deeply, critically important part of my path through all of this stuff. However, the more experience I got with them and the more other people I observed interacting with them, the more I appreciated just how lucky I got with the, the, the particular context in which I happened to approach them and just all kinds of basically luck factors um, that allowed me to, you know, engage with that level of practice very deeply in a way that I feel like I was able to retain what I would describe as sanity and ability to fundamentally relate to other human beings who hadn't gone down that road because I went really far down that road and so, uh, some of you here who are regulars have heard me talk about just how far I went down that road and let's just say I'm an outlier with respect to humanity in general when it comes to that and everyone else that I know that went down that road that far ended up from my perspective, fairly profoundly damaged. And so that being said, I think psychedelics can be a super useful tool and one that I um, you know, value in the sense of, um, obviously it was hugely important to me personally, I feel sentimental towards it. I also think that it can be one of the most powerful tools in the toolbox to be able to kick people up temporarily into the capacities of a higher stage. Um, you know, you've got Terence McKenna's theories about how language and rationality may have evolved when proto-humans encountered mushrooms. And I don't know how much credence I put in that, but it's certainly worth a look, right? Uh, Stone Ape hypothesis and so on. But psychedelics I view as a subset of what could be called tantric paths, right? And so in Buddhism, um, there's this idea that the sutric paths are uh, fundamentally safe you're at worst going to tread water, but you're not going to go backwards um, and do harm to yourself. But the tantric paths, although they may be in some sense more powerful, quicker, or more efficient ways to reach the goal state, 
they are also much more dangerous because there is the very distinct possibly possibility of going backwards, fucking yourself up, and or fucking people up around you, right? Um, a lot of the most famous tantrikas um, of the Tibetan tradition were former or reformed black magicians in a culture that very deeply treats that as a real thing. So um, I would put psychedelics in that category. And I would say that, you know, unfortunately, I've talked to a lot of the people that are sort of leading efforts in the psychedelic assisted uh, therapy, psychedelic integration therapy. And I think that bringing that Western medicalized frame to it is probably not a step in the right direction on average. I don't know that that's going to be effective, especially when we talk about heroic doses or extremely potent substances like say 5-methoxy DMT, ibogaine, et cetera, um, ayahuasca that, you know, we should be looking more at the psychotext developed by indigenous peoples for dealing with these sorts of things than at a Western medicalized model. Um, and of course, there's some wiggle room. I think that MDMA-based uh, uh, psychotherapy for PTSD is showing enormous promise. Um, you know, uh, so, so th there's some gray areas here, but in general, I'm a bit suspicious of the medicalized approach to psychedelic use. And I don't think that our culture in general has the greatest framing or context for this. That being said, I would recommend the book by James Fadiman, The Psychedelic Explorers. I forget whether it's guidebook or handbook, but he was one of the main researchers back before they banned the research. And he continued his research underground for decades and spoke with other researchers. And it has a great set of guides for how to use psychedelics for personal growth, for healing trauma, for religious or spiritual practice, and just for fun, creating a marvelous party atmosphere. And it's a really good overview of sort of best practices with respect to how to not fuck up that experience. And so I would recommend that in that context. Any uh, follow-up question, Ryan? Yeah, quick. Um, so if I go really far down the psychedelic path, do I get like lights shooting at the top of my head that are just like psychedelic projecting on my ceiling like you got um, um no you can get that for 20 bucks on amazon <laughs> nice awesome but uh for real real talk um i hear you kind of advocating for like uh rigorous remixing of wisdom paths both western and eastern yeah um, and, and so then going down that path and kind of getting to what rob hart was talking about just a little bit about, and what you just mentioned, there are some dangers that exist if you go down that tantric path. So how do we as a community or people as a community protect themselves when going really deep into this phenomenological self-inquiry? Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I would say community support is essential. Um, first of all, as a community is critically important in your question. Um, second is, um, you know, looking to people a little bit further along the path. I'm, I'm kind of personally allergic to guru-based or even straight teacher-student-based models for how to relate to this stuff. I like the spiritual friend model a lot better where we can let temporary natural hierarchies form with respect to people's domain-specific knowledge about certain types of practice or certain tools or certain psychedelics. Um, but that those hierarchies are, are ephemeral. They form around certain domain specific topics and they are not global hierarchies within the community. Um, the global community is egalitarian, but these temporary natural hierarchies can arise and dissipate as necessary to help people engage with this stuff. And it's usually fairly easy to recognize expertise intuitively when you see it. Now, that being said, it's also important to get some skill in diagnostics. And I think that these diagnostics, unfortunately, cannot be, in my opinion, systematized a la the DSM, which is a garbage text in the first place, um, but uh, can be cultivated in the, the manner of, um, say, uh, certain teachers in the shamanic or tantric tra traditions having an intuitive felt sense that seems to arise from something very much like Gendlin's focusing of what's gonna resonate with a given person and also what that person's acceptable risk to reward, ra reward ratio is. Um, and there is a certain amount of personal sovereignty that's required to explore this territory, um, meaning that you have to have some sense of your risk to reward, reward, blah, 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 reward ratio and you have to be aware that absolutely nothing in life is risk-free. I mean, you could be sitting on your ass on this stoic call and a meteor could just come and take your head off and that's a low probability outcome, but you know, you're taking that risk by not living in a steel reinforced concrete bunker. So everybody has different risk appetites and that is a thing that unfortunately there's not a one size fits all answer to, I think. All right, 
Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Victor, you're up next. You there, Victor? No? I was, uh, I was surprised. So, Evan, hey, man. Hey. Uh, <laughs> so what's your best idea about how to break frame for the largest number of human beings? Well, my honest answer to that is psychedelics, but frame breaking is an inherently risky process. Okay, because you didn't ask me the safest way to break frame, right? Um, so I'm interpreting best as meaning most effective, right? But I think that frame breaking as quickly as possible, the hot and fast pursuit of frame breaking is not usually indicated in this sort of thing. I, I tend to think that it's more optimal if people gradually explore the boundaries of their frames through a more naturalized um, you know, phenomenological self-inquiry that doesn't need to involve any specific practices or adjuncts to, to that. It's, it's just literally looking within an, in, a, in a disciplined and, and uh, consistent way. Um, yeah, somebody in the chat just said a slow loving breaking of frame. That to me is really ideal. Um, now, now the answer to the question of what's most likely to break frame for the most people as quickly as possible, I do think is something like psychedelics. But again, I question the wisdom of advocating that as a globally encouraged practice for reasons I've gone into in some of the answers to the previous questions. Does that wiggly fingers mean you're satisfied, uh, Victor? It works for me, thank you. Cool. All right. Da, da, da. Who is next? Caitlin, did you have a, have a question? Sure, yeah. Um, so, hi, Evan. Hi. <laughs> um, uh, so you're talking about um, communities practicing and communicating about uh, their phenomenological inquiry processes and experiences to help guide them and kind of keep them from getting into some of the pitfalls that you talked about. So I'm wondering like how you see communities forming and functioning. Is it around specific frameworks or traditions or just more broadly based? And then how do we communicate across different frameworks and traditions in a useful way? Yeah, so um, I totally recommend checking out Vincent Horn's talk that he did yesterday at the Stoa called the Meta Sangha, whenever that is posted on YouTube, if it's not already, because he goes into some of these issues there. But I'll, I'll just give some brief thoughts on that. We already have tons of actually existing practice communities surrounding most of the established traditions, as well as most of the New Age traditions as well, right? So um, those are super useful, but I do think what's needed is some sort of meta Sangha approach where there is an interplay and interchange between these more insular and tradition focused communities, because this can help us avoid some of the dynamics of um, predation, frankly, which happen in those communities. I mean, it's just become a depressingly regular trope for Buddhist or, or new age inflected spiritual teachers to end up in terrible sex scandals or end up, you know, like Osho did with 99 Rolls Royces or however many it was. And I mean, not to say that these people didn't have some profound personal subjective realization, but that's a fucking failure mode, culturally speaking, right? And, uh, and so the insularity and the exclusive truth claims, I think, are problematic. So I'm not, I, I try to be very careful about this in my presentation here. I'm not trying to make any sort of exclusive truth claims. I'm trying to really heavily emphasize the indexical nature of language um, to, to, to make that uh, really clear. And so I think that, 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 that just the meta Sangha itself, people who are, have one foot in multiple communities is really valuable. I think that people who have a natural skepticism, and a lot of people that show up here on the STOA are great examples of this, they have a natural skepticism where they're really skeptical of any sort of truth claims. And people like that serve a great social function in these contexts. And I do think that the urge to universalization or to create map correspondences, like say what you will about the guy personally, 
Ken Wilber has done some great work in this area. Um, Daniel Ingram has done some really great work in his updated version of Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha, where he compares something like 20 plus different um, staged or path models of what development spiritually looks like and looks for the cross-cultural similarities. Houston Smith did some great work on this decades ago in comparative religion. Um, William James uh, looking at varieties of religious experience. So that sort of you know, generalist work, I think is crucial for um, preventing us from getting captured by groupthink, which naturally arises in the context of communities focused on one teacher or one lineage or one tradition, if that makes sense. So I know that was just a lot of stuff, but hopefully that's some sort of gesture at an answer. Yeah, I guess I'm sorry. Can I follow yep. up? Um, yeah, I'm thinking about like the, um, you know, how to, how to help people find the Meta Sangha communities like you're talking about, you know, like if they're very, if they are in a um, like single teacher or, you know, very well established tradition, um, you know, and I guess, I don't know, I don't know if this is the right forum to, to, to discuss all those specifics, but um, yeah, yeah, I guess I mean, also wondering about like how, um, like how is, is there a danger in the meta Sangha communities of um, when people are working within different traditions or frameworks um, and someone is bringing their experience to discuss, um, you know, of the breakdown of the language where you're using language differently from somebody else and then it like corrupts the practice in a way um, that isn't intended. Like how, how do you see gotcha. the, the communication happening across disciplines? Okay, so um, that's why I emphasized indexicality of language so heavily in the presentation because this is a crucial point. Um, second, there's a thing that the rationalist community, the less wrong style rationalist community does that they call rationalist taboo, which is where you taboo a given word and you have to say what you mean without using that word. So for example, ego is a word that is what I call semantically overloaded. It has meanings in the Freudian context and the Jungian context and the general Western cultural context and the context from Buddhism and the context from Hinduism, the context from Stoicism, the list goes on, right? So what the hell does somebody mean when they use the word ego? I have no fucking clue. So I need them to explain what they mean without using the word ego. And so if we can develop a practice of asking people to taboo certain specialist vocabulary and explain what they mean from um, something that is in our currently shared phenomenological context, right? Then that's one way to sort of route around that kind of confusion or that like impotence mismatch between different ways of languaging things. Um, and that's crucial for a, a meta sangha um, is, is to have group norms where this is in fact a thing that is done. And that's one reason I point to something like the Stoa as a good example of a meta sangha is because that kind of thing happens all the time here, um, both in the, the, the official Stoa events and in the sense of community that forms around those events and this space is that people are coming from all kinds of different traditions and we're gradually coming up with a shared language to translate between those different traditions. And it's also important that people commit to being non-dogmatic, right? What I mean by this is uh, due to all the crap I said earlier about indexicality and models and uh, models being compressions on reality and so on, the map is not the territory, we can't become too attached to our way of languaging things. And there's a certain flexibility where we have to learn to speak each other's language. You know, um, you know, you and I probably actually share a language because you've known me your entire life. But for most people that I meet, I operate from the assumption that we actually don't speak the same language. And so I have to learn their language in order to communicate with them. And I think that taking an assumption like that into interactions across traditions or sanghas is crucially important for enabling clear communication without getting caught up in the, 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 the issues of different languaging and framing. So to double click on the, the STOA thing, um, uh, you told uh, in this this talk, and then we talked privately as well, that the, the STOA dehermitized you in a way that you, you came up hiding and then you found something here. Um, so what is it about the STOA in particular as it's currently held that you think it's getting right? And then how could it become more conscious of this collectively? Um, and what do you hope it could do, uh, quote unquote, better? So. Interesting questions, of course, as always, Peter. So the Stoa dehermitized me because 
I spent a lot of time flitting about various communities of ancient wisdom traditions and also various communities of scientific practitioners um, in, my, in my 20s. And all the stuff that Caitlin was just going into, the dogmatism, the inability to express things except in the orthodox frame of that community were huge turnoffs to me. And the lack of openness to other paths, you know, my way or the highway is so common in these spaces. It's super obnoxious. Like I remember some of my first introductions to meditation in general were the wonderful 11 day silent retreats put on by the Goenka guys. And I love the experience of that. But they tell you after a certain number of retreats coming back to an old student, you have to commit to doing their practices and not other practices. And I was practicing Qigong and some stoic uh, sorts of uh, meditations and so on at the time. And they told me that was incompatible with continuing to be a part of their community on the long term. And so I said, you know what, screw you guys. And that was basically my experience in every actually existing spiritual community that I managed to find and become a part of. And so that's what led to me being a hermit in the first place. And then I had managed to discover some... Um, some wonderful people who seem to operate from a similar frame. And I would describe these roughly as the pragmatic Dharma cluster, including people like Shenzhen Young, like Daniel Ingram, like Michael Taft, all of whom either, or Vince Horn, all of whom either have been or will be guests on the STOA, not coincidentally. And so I actually heard about the STOA through one of Michael's podcasts with Charlie, AKA Rids and Pamo, discussing the Evolving Ground Project. And that's how I even heard of the STOA. And so, in a certain sense, it's my resistance to dogmatism and orthodoxy in these traditions, and yet my continuing engagement with practitioners of these traditions who are also willing to step outside of the bounds of orthodoxy and dogma that led me to the Stoa in the first place. And then the Stoa dehermitized me because it wasn't just these like famous teacher people, just about damn near everyone I've interacted with on the Stoa has that sort of shared framing of you know, well, like I talked about principle omega and the, the, or, so the rule omega and the principle of charity, you know, like appreciating that other human beings are sources of rich signal, no matter how much noise you perceive there at first, like Daniel likes to talk about, uh, Daniel Smachtenberger in this case, um, hearing a community and seeing people coming on the community um, as invited guests who were expressing these ideals. I was like, oh, I found my people. These are the people I spent 15 years looking for and gave up on ever finding. And of course, right after I gave up for a few years, the universe then presents them to me on a silver platter. You can talk about that as synchronicity or whatever, but that's the way it worked out. Um, and then, so if you can remind me of the second two parts of your question, because that was kind of long spiel. Uh, I think I, I forget what I even asked. Um, yeah, what could the Stoa uh, do better? What can it uh, be conscious of? Mm, um, so, I know that the wisdom gem is seeming to be in a little bit of flux right now, but I would really like to see a sort of wisdom gem thing that's along the lines of maybe what they're doing with the uh, social design club, but just for practices in general, right? Like a sort of um, neutral ground for discussing our experiences with and merits uh, of various practices that individual stoans have explored. And as well as, I think you've mentioned this to me before, the concept of Dharma dueling. Um, within a friendly and principle of charity based context, right? But I would absolutely love to see some of these people we've already had on the STOA come and just duke it out mentally about their models and really like hard hittingly expose some of the, the, the potential flaws in ways of languaging things or various orthodoxies of the traditions that they come from. And, and, and that seems hugely valuable as well to me. Um, so th those would be my sorts of suggestions in that vein. Yes, yeah, that's, that's really good. Um... We're thinking of launching Dharma Combat here and the Platonic Fight Club. And the idea is to get, you know, all these different people that don't talk to each other normally warm by the digital campfire and then seduce them into that. Yeah, um, exactly. Because I mean, we kind of do that, but it's all of us on the STOA who are the regulars talking to these people as individuals. I'd love to see them getting, I mean, you kind of see some of this starting to emerge with the uh, conversations and uh, is it high pitch or newer key, whatever, um, that event that you have with all the, the women of the SOA village, that is a great sort of gesture in this direction, I think already too. Totally. All right, so we'll try to sneak in two more questions. Uh, uh, we didn't get to all of them, but uh, Evan is gonna drop his discord. Uh, so you imagine the conversation can continue there. Uh, who was the one that had five? It was a Charles, Charles. Um, you're up next. Yeah, my question is pretty straightforward. I think it just comes through, you know, like forming the communities. I think, you know, everybody has different 
strengths and weakness that they and then and then and then for and then we need different kind of roles like you mentioned you know bridge builder architect the crosser guys right so i think for for i think i'm just interested in, in your thoughts on you know how to help organically kind of like you know for everybody to find their optimal roles and um how that how that process how how this community how this like across kind of functional community can organically form um yeah so really good question um i want to start out by noting that i don't think that the roles that somebody is optimal for will necessarily remain static over time okay um so for example if you want to view this as a sort of um you know ephemeral hierarchy the bridge crosser would probably be the least experienced sort of person and a bridge guide may be somebody who can help other people cross a bridge that they've already crossed, um, but they don't necessarily have the skill to build bridges themselves. Um, then maybe you have the bridge builder who can build bridges based on um, the, the deeper principles which they've absorbed from other people, but they're not capable of recapitulating the deeper principles of bridge design on a meta level the same way that say a bridge architect would be capable of doing. And I see roles for all of these sorts of people in the community. And I think it's actually quite important that communities or sanghas or meta sanghas have a mix of these levels of ability or archetypes um, found within them. And that it's not just all people at the same level. Um, because otherwise then you're, you're dangerously close to falling into some sort of orthodoxy or cult status. And that's precisely the opposite of what I'm trying to advocate here. Um, so uh, I feel like that answered part of your question. And if you had another follow-up or a second part that I missed, I'd appreciate it if you could repeat it for me. Yeah, I think it's just the constant struggle of, you know, like um, the, 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 the hierarchy is uh, forming, I, I think as a result, you know, like, the, the hier like you know, we're social creatures and we just like, you know, like, and based on, we constantly gauge each other's expertise and, you know, like, uh, and then, and hierarchy tend to form. And then I think for me, it's like, I work at a very small company of six people and we're all very closely knitted and we, we're, we're, we, we practice, we're very, you know, like kind of trusting of each other. But then because three of them are the founders, and even though as much as they try to basically uh, kind of combat that tendency for hierarchy to form, still the three of us non-founders still tend to be more maybe like submissive or non-questioning toward their judgments and stuff. So I think it's just, uh, I guess I guess how to, yeah, I don't know. I guess this is more just a statement. It's just a yeah, well, well, I'm glad you brought funding into that, right? Because this has been a critically important thing for me. Um, so, you know, I have a day job. I'm a, currently a mechatronics engineer, right? And I think that it would have been relatively simple if I wanted to, to go set myself up as some kind of like teacher of this stuff. But it's very important to me that I do not monetize this, right? Because specifically bringing money into the picture does tend to, um, you know, uh, does tend to create a sort of implicit hierarchy that people can't seem to escape from. And so I think that that money is one source of this sort of pernicious hierarchy that tends to persist and not be ephemeral or a natural hierarchy. Um, another source of it is formalized roles. So like say the teacher student role um, is fine within a limited context or say mentor mentee, but I really love the approach taken by say the SF Dharma Collective um, that Katie from there was describing in a session yesterday here on the STOA where, where basically if, as far as the governance, like in terms of financial and organizational governance of the collective goes, anybody who's a teacher there has to sort of like take off their teacher hat. Everybody is, is an equal in the sense of how that governance structure works. Teachers have no privileged uh, status whatsoever when it comes to the practical nitty gritty of running the collective, doing the finances, running the space, et cetera, right? And so, um, so I think that's also important is that to the extent that any sort of hierarchies form naturally based on differing levels of ability, that those hierarchies, uh, that we take steps to not reify those in other contexts, right? So um, if we have some sort of community where decisions need to be made on behalf of the community, no one, not even the founder of the community should get extra votes in that, right? That's one sort of defense against that. And I mean, really, um, I think that I'm going to echo Daniel Schmachtenberger here and say that I think that it's a critically important thing for people that are engaged in social design or community organization to become familiar with power dynamics and what he calls power literacy. 
because if you do that and specifically like look at the really nasty stuff there, like read Thomas Schelling's strategy of conflict, go into the real deep game theory of it. You'll see how to avoid a lot of these failure modes if you engage with things on that level and how to create durable structures which are able to be um, less vulnerable to these failure modes. And this is in, in essence what all the game B people are trying to do is to figure out how to actualize this sort of community. So it's definitely a work in progress, right? But I think for now, the best we can do is to be aware of the failure modes and as a community, keep each other in check when we start to see the emergence of toxic power dynamics. All right, uh, I promised I'd take uh, Ethan in before we close. Um, Ethan, you're up. Awesome, thanks. Uh, Evan, man, this is, this is awesome. Um, super alive for me right now, topically. And your your grasp of these super abstract concepts is is impress very impressive. And, and oh, thanks. thanks. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to hear you comment on if you're familiar with it, the effective value meme concept from Hansi Freinacht, um, as kind of a, I guess, complement or alternative to using Keegan's work as like primary like stage development um, in this kind of broader map that you're painting. Um, just out of necessity, when shit started hitting the fan in my own head and I started going through different stages, like that framework in particular ended up being super helpful for me, like in just kind of making sense of how to value and think about the different ways in which I might be growing or not and how they all kind of fit together. So given that you've looked into this a lot, I'm curious if, uh, if you have an opinion on that framework or anything else. Yeah, can... I, I see it as generally compatible with the Keegan framework, though maybe operating from a slightly different level of abstraction, if that makes sense. Like, I, I think that it, it probably, like effective value meme framework, as Hansi puts it, tends to map, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, slightly better to societal dynamics and, um, the Keegan stages model tends to map slightly better to individual or small organizational dynamics. Um, that's my, uh, my take on that. But I do see them as being broadly compatible. I had something about that in one of the later slides about, you know, you can look at like modern to postmodern to metamodern as being quite analogous to Keegan stage like four to 4.5 to five, right? And, 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 you know, Hansi talks about like the metamodern value meme, right? So I do see the connection there. Um, and, and I, 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 I hope I went into this enough. I'm not at all wedded to Keegan stages. Um, I had to pick somewhere to start off this conversation with. And I thought David Chapman's suggestion of the need for a bridge was a really useful jumping off point. And so I sort of ran with the frameworks that David likes to use, which includes the Keegan stage model. But I think we could have just as easily had this conversation using the, the model put forward in the Hansi Freinach books, especially the Nordic Society. So. Uh, does that make sense or somewhat address your question? Do you have a follow-up there? Yeah, quick follow-up, I guess. To, uh, it, it's uh, specifically the different dimensions of development within that framework or what right. was I found personally useful, even though they are potentially on a more societal abstraction level. Um, yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. So like, I hate to be like a weasel here, but I'm going to say that I think there's a certain non-duality between like a separate dimensional axis model versus a, unit dim a unitary dimensional axis model, right? Meaning that, okay, from a certain point of view, it's quite meaningful to talk about, say, like these four separate quadrants or areas, right? But from another perspective, development in them does tend to correlate in individuals. So like, it's very unusual to find somebody really, really highly developed in one area and really, really underdeveloped in another area. Although certainly you see people with different levels of development in the different areas, they still tend to cluster around a certain center of gravity. At least that's my experience and my opinion. So I, I do see there being a, a utility of both styles of model, like the one axis model or the four quadrants model or what have you. You know, you could talk about Ken Wilber's models here too as well, right? Um, but I, I, I think of them as both being like fundamentally what the rationalists would call fake frameworks and that they have some pragmatic utility, but they probably don't carve reality at the joints. And so I will myself kind of tend to fluidly switch between such models depending on the domain that I'm engaging with or analyzing, if that makes sense. Okay, cool. Actually, if, if you have like five more minutes to sneak in one question, it's, it's Go for a, it. a good one to end off on. Uh, James, uh, you had a, a question. 
Thanks. Yeah. And it, this is about, yeah, maybe kind of heading out of here and kind of what are the next steps. Uh, first, I want to say um, this is amazing, Evan, 100 <laughs> percent. Wow. Yes. Uh, and and I feel like I can say that um, honestly, as I've spent like the, the past couple of years working to get to uh, what feels like almost exactly the same place. Uh, although I won't claim to have like two thirds of your specific knowledge, uh, you know, and I have a few different building blocks myself, but um, so I don't know, you find me on the cusp of, um, uh, I'm actually going to try to launch a, a an ongoing community uh, organization of some kind to try to kind of do this. So I'm wondering for, for you, and I'm not saying our things are the same or, or different or whatever, but uh, for you, what do you think you're the, the, the next steps are? Are you planning to take the folks who show up on your Discord and then um, make something uh, of an ongoing process or create this meta sangha or what, what kind of vision do you have for your next steps? Well, that's really highly contingent. Um, you know, in terms of the, uh, the say, fluid mode of relating to things, I tend to view relating to reality as having a lot to do with surfing, right? You know, you find the flow and you go with it rather than trying to impose your own ideas of how the flow should be. So that's kind of my broad outlook on these things. So that being said, I created the bridge discord so that people would have a place to congregate and sort of post session sense make about the stuff that I brought up today. And I'm really excited to see what happens out of that. I do intend to do some further sessions um, going down and breaking up um, some of the more of the details of how I would analyze the, you know, elements of various specific ancient wisdom traditions or specific modern takes, say neuroscientific takes. I, I want to go into Yosha Box computational metapsychology and do a whole session on that, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, I'd be happy to do that, um, say, on the STOA, if that was an available option. I'd be happy to do that on private events organized um, through the Bridge Discord. I'd be happy to be a guest in whatever thing that you're putting together. And I definitely see the importance of, like, a network of sanghas uh, forming this, like, network of meta sanghas, network of sanghas, a sort of fractal structure whereby we have groups of humans with connections between them. And then we have connections between the groups where the groups are themselves individuals and so on and so forth in a sort of fractal structure. And I'm interested in engaging with that structure and, you know, like uh, wherever people will like have me. Um, and, and I don't claim to have the ultimate answers to anything. I claim to be good at helping people refine questions. And that's really what I have to offer. So in that sense, um, you know, let's all help each other refine our questions. And, uh, and, and you know, for me, I, I, I don't really think there are answers. The answer is just reality. And the questions are a continual process of refinement of our models. And to me, this is a great field of play and fun, and I'm happy to share it with you guys. Awesome. Uh, on that note, I'll make some closing announcements. But uh, Evan, Thank you so much, my friend, for finding us, really, and giving us uh, your, your gift. Um, well, sure... Thanks for having me, Peter. It's been wonderful for me in my life, personally, to have encountered you and all the wonderful faces of the STOA, so I can't thank you enough. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, and I'm sure we'll see Evan again at the, the STOA in various capacities. Um, so upcoming events. Uh, I'll plug just two. Uh, we have uh, Daniel Ingram, who Devin, uh, Evan was talking about. That is December 8th, 3 p.m. Eastern time. And then in about 25 minutes, we have the glass bead game. Um, I'm going to be there. Uh, I'm probably going to have a drink. So if you want to join me, uh, let's, let's, let's all just go and do glass bead game and <laughs> sense make our asses off. Um, so that being said, Evan, everyone, Thank you so much for coming to the store. Thanks, Peter. We'll some cash on the way out.